This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is sponsored by Columbia Southern University. Learn more about how you can earn an affordable, accredited quality degree 100% online at columbiasouthern.edu slash fire. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Zamzow. I am a fire lieutenant up in Wisconsin, way up north there. I'm also a writer for Fire Rescue One. Uh, I, and I write for this person that is with me always, the commander, Janelle Fasquette. Janelle, tell me something good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to have one of our new editorial advisory board members on the show today. So looking forward to talking. Yeah, we have today, we have Chief Rocco Elvero. He has got quite a great story. And as you mentioned, he's a new member of FR1's editorial advisory board. Congrats on that and welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it, man. I'm honored to be here. Uh, privileged, man. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. You're a battalion chief with Fairfax County, Virginia, Fire and Rescue Department. You're currently assigned to the training division. You, uh, you serve as a section lead for professional development which we will really talk about because I'm curious on. Um, and you're directly responsible for creating the organizational leadership and professional de uh, development training for every, everyone in the department, all the personnel, including uniformed and civilian, and, and you have volunteer staff. And we were talking behind the scenes. You've been in the fire service for almost 40 years, and I, I don't think the math adds up because you look like you're about 40. So when did you get involved in the fire service, Chief? Uh, very early age as a young, you know, young teenager in, uh, up in uh, upstate New York, Liverpool, New York, um, incredible volunteer fire department, even to this day. Um, if you're not familiar with the area, it actually borders the city of Syracuse, which is an incredible career department, hands down, one of the best, you know, a little bit of bias there because I was <laughs> grew, up in, grew up in the city and then moved to the suburbs. But yeah, I got my start as a volunteer. i uh, very proud of that start. I've never forgotten my roots. Um, just incredible experience. It really was. Spent a handful of years up there as a volunteer. Found myself coming down to Maryland, volunteered there, and eventually uh, got a job with Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. You got to tell the story of why. Like, what was, I, I love talking to our guests about, like, what was the moment you're like, hey, this is for me, and how did you kind of get your first steps into a firehouse? I love this story. I tell you, and we obviously we spoke. Um, I, I was I wanted to be a police officer. You know, growing up, I had no aspirations of, of being a uh, firefighter. Even though, when I was a kid growing up in the city of Syracuse, anytime their fire trucks uh, would drive by, we'd always chase them. That's what we did, right? A group of us would always follow the fire trucks, and lo and behold, they would be going to something really good, especially on the north side of Syracuse. Um, so it never really crossed my mind. Uh, growing up, uh, you know, leaving high school, graduating from high school, I want to be a police officer. Um, one day driving by the local firehouse, the volunteer station in Liverpool, um, station number two, there were just a bunch of sheriff's deputies parked in the uh, parking lot. And they always were there. So I figured I'd stop in, talk to them, and just get, for, get some information on becoming a sheriff's deputy. So as we discussed, I walked in, had a great conversation. Uh, lo and behold, all those deputies were also volunteer firefighters uh, with Liverpool. So what do you think they did, right? Hey, here's the application to be a volunteer. I'm not going to say no because I want to be their friends. I want to get to know them. So ultimately, I can become a police officer, a sheriff's deputy. Um, well, you know what? Once you... You hop on that fire truck and you run that first call. I tell you what, it, it it was incredible. You know, they may have sold me a bag of goods on that day, but riding a fire truck, there's just nothing like it. I, I was done. I was in. I was a hundred percent in, and then everything changed. My my whole my whole life, my whole vision, everything I wanted to do swung from being law enforcement to now being a firefighter. And I've never looked back. And you, you have a passion for personal development, and that's now led to professional development or organizational development. Do you think that's started because you're on this fire truck? You're like, how do I get to be full time? How can this be my career? 
is that kind of where everything started? You're like, okay, what do I got to do next to get to that next level? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always been competitive by nature, right? I mean, played sports and everything. And I always wanted to, to, to do better, be better, become better, right? And it was, hey, this is, I'm doing this as a volunteer. I've seen what the city of Syracuse firefighters do. I want to do it all the time. Um, but, you know, but back in the day, you know, when you're competing for just, you know, one or two positions or you're competing against thousands of people back in the day, it's not like it is today where we're facing, you know, recruitment and retention struggles. Back in the day, you were one of thousands competing for that, for just those handful of positions. So it was just moving, you know, no one was hiring up north. So where else are people hiring? I moved to the DMV and eventually was hired by Fairfax. But yeah, it goes back to what you said, Aaron, just that constant pursuit, that constant journey to become better personally and professionally. Yeah. And finding that passion helps a little bit, helps keep you motivated. You know, let's talk a little bit about recruitment and professional development. How do you think those two things can play off each other? Oh, absolutely. Recruitment and professional development. Well, let me give you an example, right? Here in the DMV, um, everyone is competing for the same small pool of individuals, right? Because we're not getting those thousands of applications anymore, right? Across the fire service, at least here yeah. in, in the, uh, the greater, you know, district, Virginia, and Maryland region, right? So when you look at professional development, what can we offer? What can Fairfax County offer that other jurisdictions don't, right? To entice individuals to come to our department. And I believe it is, it is a career pathway. It is having a pathway that is, that is spelled out, that is written out, and a robust program that supports and grows those within your agency, right? And that includes tuition reimbursement, right? And I think that's what young folks, uh, even some with a little bit older experience and maybe coming from a different uh, work environment, a different job, they're looking to always be, I think, personally and professionally developed. So us or any agency, if you can offer a robust professional development and career pathway that someone else in your area that's also hiring doesn't have, to me, that's going to give you that little bit of an edge to maybe get those extra few hundred, that extra hundred applicants applying to your specific department. Yeah, and solid applicants that fit the personality trait that you really want most, which is what we've what we've catered the program on is is a willingness and a passion to improve, right? So you know you have very well vetted these people because they believe in that, you know. So um, it's it is a great kind of mesh and mold there. But why is that so important? Like, why is it, you know, getting a college education or more education so important in the fire service? Some people say, man, it's a blue collar job. It is. I agree. It is a blue collar job, right, Aaron? I'm yep. not going to argue that point. Parts, parts of it are. Parts, parts of it are of not. It are. Parts of it are, right? But, but, but here's a caveat, right? It's, to, it's the totality of training, experience, and education, right? And when you really dive into education, it's that informal education that your department can offer, right? And that others within the industry can offer, but also it's that formal education that only universities and colleges can offer, right? So you're saying, well, it, it's a blue collar job. Like we just, we pull hose and we throw ladders and everything's good. We just go back to the station and we sit around the kitchen table and talk about all the great work we, we have done. And we do great work. The fire service does incredible work every single day. But here's the problem, Aaron. 10, 15 years ago, was the fire service ready for lithium ion batteries? Was the fire service ready for climate change? No. So those are the black swans that Gordon Graham talks about, right? So those are the gray rhinos now, right? Because we know they're here. We're dealing with them. But here's the problem. And here's a problem that I think higher education can help solve within the industry, within the fire service is what's over the horizon. What are the black swans that we don't see right now, right? That are coming our way. And are you going to have a workforce that is professionally developed and ready to deal with those black swans? And as a fire chief, you have to ask yourself that question, you know, and it should be part of your strategic plan for us. We have a two to three year, we have a three year strategic plan. It was a five year plan. 
But Chief Butler modified that. And we're going to deal with a three-year plan because the fire service is changing. Our industry is changing so rapidly and it's so dynamic that you cannot plan five years out. You just can't. You have to be within that three-year window because things are changing. The workforce is changing, right? Recruitment and retention. Pre-COVID wasn't an issue. Thousands of applications coming in every single day. Something happened. Something happened. That black rhino hit us square in the face. And now the majority of, of, of career combination departments, volunteer departments, are struggling to find applicants. Yeah. And then we're also struggling with all the different kind of uh, variables within the fire service uh, from the standpoint of health, cancer, mm -hmm. mental health, you know, and then uh, you know, you had recruitment and, and one of our, you know, what firefighters want survey talked about stress and stress management also trying to, you know, not necessarily, you know, well, find ways to better manage our stress, but also to market what we're doing, right? You need your, the skills that you, you do learn with higher education and, and those development things, uh, or things that you learn within a professional development that you can apply right away because otherwise we're reactive. Right. And we could almost get away with being reactive back in the day. But now things change so much. If you're reactive, you're already two years, three years, four years, five years behind. Right, Chief? Yeah, absolutely. And you also and you have to. And then part of our strategic plan, right, involved one of our stakeholders was obviously community. Right. And you ask the community what they want. What do they want from your workforce, from your firefighting workforce? Um, overwhelmingly, one of their responses were we wanted an educated workforce, an educated workforce responding to my home. That's what our stakeholders said. Our citizens said they're demanding it. Right. And that's part of our strategic plan. We're working through that now. They want innovators. They want visionaries. Right. The days of just hopping on a fire truck and riding the call and ride and going to that call and coming back. There's more to it now. Right. If you look at every major metropolitan department and beyond CRR initiatives. So now you're staying and you're doing one extra thing for the community, one extra thing for that individual that called you. What other services do they need? You're no longer just walking away. The call is over. You're now, in, you're now engaging your CRR office to engage them to see how they can provide a, a better and robust service to the community, right? Now you're collecting data, Aaron, right? Data that in the back end, someone has to read. Well, data analytics is pretty complicated. It means something. And if you're going to be data informed and eventually data driven based on that information, someone has to interpret that data, somebody, and someone has to be educated enough to understand it, interpret it, and then put it into a plan of action. That is where higher education, that is where professional development, which, which means a lot, right? Professional development just doesn't encompass college. There's a lot to it. Yeah. Dealing with people, because that's the other half of our issue you know we had kurt verone on who is d does um a lot of litigation within fire service says a lot of our litigation isn't with you know fires it's it's amongst our our own people or you know it, it has a lot to do with that so we have to also stay ahead on that side too right which we we don't get in books sometimes right it's from a state level you don't get how you deal with people and and those are the some of the as i think chief lieb even said those are the soft skills that we need to start really focusing on yeah you're absolutely right aaron you know what and it goes back to and i don't know where i heard this before but you know we hire for competency and we fire for character that's what happens in the fire service right and if you don't work on on developing your people developing those soft skills developing those those conflict management those de-escalation skills working on empathy psychological safety if you're a department that doesn't focus on developing your people personally um, then that's a piece of the puzzle that eventually is going to come back to haunt you, right? Did you always envision yourself going through some sort of advanced degree program, higher education when you first entered the fire service? Or is that something that you kind of figured out the importance of along the way? Janelle, I have a story for you and let me share it with you, right? I took my first college class and this is going to give away my age, right? I took my first college class in 1980. I completed two associate's degrees, right, um, before being hired by Fairfax. Um, so that's great. Again, did, did not know what I wanted to do. 
just kept taking classes and eventually lo and behold, I had an associate's degree. And because I took so many classes, I took a couple more and I got my second associate's degree. It's like, wow, good for you, Rock. You've done a great job, right? First college class in 1985, I finished my bachelor's of science in 2023 last year. <laughs> Congratulations. Yep. Yep. And I'm now I'm in my master's program because now it means something to me, right? Because now it goes back to Rocco being competitive. And I'll share the story with you talking to uh, a good mentor of mine um, when looking at my resume. And he said, Rocco, this is really good stuff. You've done a great job investing in everything else, investing in your agency and investing in others. That's great, but you've done nothing for yourself. You have not marketed and branded yourself and you're a battalion chief. And then he punched me in the face figuratively and said, and you're the battalion chief of the professional development section. And you're telling people to be personally and professionally developed, yet you're not professionally developing yourself. That sank in. And that night, that, that was painful. That was a painful pill to swallow. But that is what a mentor does. A mentor provides that guidance. And that was a slap in the face that I needed. And 30 days later, this was a while ago, this was mid 2023, 30 days later, I entered my bachelor's degree program and finished it up. That's awesome. I, I got to be the guy, you know, chief, it takes a lot of people 38 years to get through school and college. They're called doctors, right? Like I, I but I'm a uh, same thing. It took me 20 years started. And then I just, and I think you made a great point. Like once you find the relativeness of it and why you're doing it, it's, it becomes easy, right? You make time for it. It's, and you, 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 you get supercharged. You talking about your, your degree and, and continuing now this, the passion is awesome. I bet you didn't have that passion when you first started. Am I, am I right? I, I did not. I just wanted to ride a fire truck. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to be a firefighter. When I got promoted to technician, which was our apparatus driver, that was the best job in the world. I absolutely loved it. Loved it. Very busy area. Uh, within Fairfax County, I absolutely wanted to do nothing else. Um, but then I saw other opportunities. I saw other opportunities to personally and professionally grow. And I just kept pursuing them. And I, it wasn't hopping rank to rank. It was staying in a rank. I spent almost 10 years in our fire investigation section. And that piece there really drove you hard because you really have to be informally and formally educated to investigate those fires and take those fires, those invest, those criminal investigations to court and obviously uh, pursue them the correct way on the stand, right? When they, when it is an arson case. So, but that, that, that was a good, it was a good time to really understand that the fire service has a lot to offer. There's more than just riding a fire truck. There's more than just driving a fire truck. The fire service is, to me, a very unique profession. Um, and you look at it just from Fairfax County, right? We offer an incredible amount of opportunities for our firefighters. In the last two years, we've had an internal career open house where we'll actually have all the different bureau sections, divisions come in and highlight everything they do for our employees. So those newer individuals that don't understand how to become hazmat, how to become part of the technical rescue team, part of the USAR team, how to be a paramedic, um, how to work at the academy um, and other bureaus and sections. We'd have an open house for them and just explain the process. And you're a very large organization. We, I think off air, we said you're a very large wheel, but it kind of just spurred a, another question. You know, you got an organization that's maybe a little bit smaller. They don't have, you know, they have the different opportunities, but instead of doing an open house, those team members, every single time they get someone who's not on that team, right? They, that's their opportunity to market the, the different avenues of the of, of, of what they're doing. Now, I want to go back to, let's say you have an engineer or somebody who's chief. I'm, I'm really happy with where I'm at. What, what does that conversation look like from your end, trying to get them to think a little bit out of the box about still developing, even though they're, they're happy with where they're at? I think it comes down to just mentorship, right? Continually having that discussion. 
um, having that open and frank discussion. But also it comes down to Aaron meeting them where they are, right? If they're happy where they are now, awesome. There is absolutely nothing wrong with retiring as a firefighter, retiring a, 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 as an apparatus engineer. There's just not. Um, but always having that conversation and, 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 and presenting opportunities for personal and professional growth, that's what mentors do. Um, and I'll even take it one step further, right? That's what officers should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Because that means a lot. When you put on that gold badge, things do need to change a little bit in the sense that now you are personally and professionally responsible for those on your shift. That means everything, health, safety, on the incident scene, um, you name it, mental health. It, it just, it, it doesn't matter, but also developing and growing them. And if they want to, even if they don't want to, is helping them get to that next rank. If they're comfortable now, I was comfortable in investigations um, until I wanted to go to the next step. Luckily, again, same thing, had a mentor that believed in me and had a mentor that provided the right pathway for me to pursue. Never gave up on me and always had that conversation even when I was settled and I was comfortable. The biggest thing you can do as an individual and the best thing you can do as a mentor is make someone feel just a little bit uncomfortable. Hey, did you ever think of putting yourself in this position for these reasons? Yeah, you kind know? of like what what your mentor did to you with no. your college education, you know, kind of throwing that in your in your lap, I guess, right? The reality. It he did. It was a it was a it was a very interesting conversation. Um, but he was honest and that's what mattered and that's what yeah. mentors do. They should make you feel uncomfortable. Is this also part of achieving buy-in with the department is that there's structure there, but they don't have to go through a process in which they are, you know, quote unquote, forced to promote. They could stay a firefighter the whole time, but they have opportunities and maybe those opportunities then create these areas of discomfort that might ultimately lead to them wanting to advance. Absolutely, Janelle. I mean, and again, it goes back to those opportunities, right? And if you want to look at, you know, and we can always pick on an agency head, right? Because I think ultimately that does fall with the agency head, right? Um, to create a pathway within your specific department so that people can grow, right? If they choose to grow, right? But but even if they don't, I think fortunately for us, we have an awesome scalable continuum of training, right? That starts from the recruit firefighter, literally all the way to the to the fire chief. And, and it is literally, it is it is drawn out it is scaled, it is scalable, right? There's pre-promotional requirements and there's post-promotional re uh, requirements at every single rank. And it starts at the recruit firefighter rank, right? Um, but it's spelled out for them. On day one, they know it exists. On day one, they can look at it and say, okay, yep, I'm a recruit now, this is what I have to do. And when I become a probationary firefighter, it's spelled out, this is what I have to do and so on and so forth at every single rank. Um, but it's just presenting the opportunity. It's almost, I wouldn't say it's enticing someone, it's just giving someone the information early and often so that it just stays embedded with them. It doesn't go away because as you know, Aaron, as you know, you know, one year in the fire service, it's just a blink of an eye. Before you know it, you've done five years and then 10 years and then all of a sudden, you're ready to retire, you know, and, and I'll take it one step further for us, for Fairfax. One of my, I think one of my greatest achievements is that I believe our department, and this goes for, I think any department, your department needs to be a farm team, right? And that's how I view our department. We look at our members as being capable enough, strong enough, trained enough, educated enough, experienced enough where when they leave our department, when they choose to leave on their terms at 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, that they have an incredible opportunity because they've developed themselves personally and professionally in our department that they can go somewhere else and have those post-retirement opportunities. Okay. You got me chief. Let's dig into this a little bit. Let's say you, you mentioned, so you're a firefighter and uh, your next step would probably be a paramedic, firefighter, paramedic, paramedic, 
AE, AE to Lieutenant, Lieutenant Captain, Captain on up. Is that right? Or the- yeah. Yeah. For our agency, it's, um, well, we'll start off recruit, right? So that's where we start. Um, from day one, we're already in your face. Professional development has you. We're doing training with our recruits. Um, and we scale it all the way up, right? Um, the next step for us is technician. That technician can be a paramedic, right? Critically important for any agency nowadays. Um, you can be a, a technical rescue. A, a uh, For us, it's TROT, our technical rescue operations team. Um, technician or a hazmat technician, right? Or a driver. So there's four technicians within our department that you can move to next. Um, again, you have to spend some time at each rank uh, to become a technician. It's two years from the time of graduation from recruit school. And the, the first officer test for us is at the five-year mark where you can become a lieutenant. From there, it's lieutenant, um, captain, battalion chief, and deputy chief. Okay. For our okay. rank structure. And so everywhere along the way, so let's say you, you want to become a technician. Are there certain classes or courses? What does that look like? Is that in-house classes? Are those state-run courses? Are those books you need to read? What does that structure look like a little bit? For us, um, and again, it really depends on in, on each rank, right? Most yeah. of our courses um, are all in-house programs. We have delegated authority to teach our own programs as long as we meet the JPRs, right? And the, the, uh, the NFPA JPRs. We meet those at every rank, and those are internal courses that we teach, right, at lieutenant, at captain, and at battalion chief, um, which coincidentally, we just rewrote our professional development resource manual, and we've sent that up. It was, a, it was literally a few years old. It, it's time. The fire service has evolved. Uh, courses have evolved, um, both internally and externally, so we updated that manual. Uh, turned it back into a draft document and sent it up to our senior leaders. And one of the things we did was we incorporated higher education at every rank. We also incorporated those soft skills, Mm -hmm. that training internally to help build that individual on the human side, which is important. And if you're a department, someone on a department right now, they're not as, as large as, as what you are there at Fairfax County, what would you recommend for them? looking at state, looking at national, kind of combining that maybe? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, number one, you have to make it scalable, right? W- within your department, starting at, at the very bottom, working all the way up to the top. But use your resources around you. Um, and I'll give an example of that, right? Uh, we have a local university that we partnered with. We're in the uh, process of developing a certificate program. It's going to be a risk management and strategic leadership um, certificate program, uh, no different than what you would take at Harvard or UCLA or Cornell. Um, it's going to be a, it's going to span several several weeks. It's going to be so many hours, but at the end, you're going to have a risk management and strategic leadership certificate from a four year university. That is in in the final stages. It's taken two years to develop, but again, it goes back to those regional and local partnerships that we use to help develop our folks. And last time I checked, there's universities, there's businesses, private and public that are willing and and able and ready to help you as a smaller department, a volunteer department, build those relationships and build a program that professionally trains your workforce. Columbia Southern University offers one of the most reputable fire professional development degrees and training programs in the nation. Touted by some of the most distinguished names in the U.S. fire industry, CSU's fire science program was created to reflect the industry's latest practices, including administration, fire safety, investigation, leadership, and more. Visit columbiasouthern.edu or call 877-347-6050 to learn more. Now, let's get back to the show. Would, Would, what's your thought on, you know, obviously departments that are neighboring when when you get two or three departments together in a certain area, right? There's a not a lot of numbers there. Create maybe a county agency or a county development process, mm-hmm. correct? Like when you guys were doing yours, where did you look? Other than you know you you had probably a vision, but what other resources did you use to create your your plan and program? For us, it was obviously actually seeing what was available first, right? And then sitting through those other programs, we actually sent. Some of our department members to those certificate programs they were online um, just to kind of get a flavor and to kind of beta test them to see what fits and what doesn't 
great feedback. But what we realized is that they were generic. They were painting those programs with a very broad brush. We wanted something that really focused hard on what the fire service does, specifically what Fairfax County does, right? So what did we do? We partnered with our with our public safety agencies, right? The police, right? Very similar, similar uh, challenges, similar hurdles when it comes to risk management and strategic leadership. So we vetted the program through them. We also vetted the program through our civilian workforce, the entire umbrella organization of Fairfax County, which numbers in the 10,000 number, right? That's a lot of people, right? So when you run this program through them, and those directors and those program managers, which are formally trained um, in, in, in bringing forth professional development programs, and you get their buy-in and you get their input, what you have, number one, is collaboration. But number two, at the end, you have a program that fits your agency, and that agency being Fairfax County, right? Partnering with, with a university, which we did, local university, you have that connection because it's a neighborhood community, right? It's a neighborhood university. But one of the uh, feed, one of the feedback items from them is, hey, this is so good. Why not just open it up to the community, to those private industries and those, and those business individuals that would find this useful so that we can have a full cohort every single time? It doesn't get any better than that. When you partner with the community, other public safety agencies, right? And that goes back to your point, Aaron, you know, we're in the DMV. What we just developed applies to every single department, police and or fire. Yeah. It goes back to that initial question of recruitment. Yeah. Honestly. Right. And, and then also community is now aware of these things that are going on, which also goes back to when you surveyed your community, they said they wanted educated personnel. Well, you're, you're now saying we're going to pay that forward into the community and include the community in it. So it's, it is a win, win, win on so many different levels. Absolutely. But let, we, we got people listening right now. I know this, they're going, Oh, that's great. You're a big organization. Yeah. You know, it's easy for you. We always, we get, it's easy for you. We all, we all know when we sit down and look at, it was not easy for you, but what would you say? Where, where do, where do departments start? It's, it's not easy for anyone. I mean, if you think about it, Aaron, it, it, the fiscal constraints that, that the industry is struggling with nowadays, we're no different. You know, there's not a money tree in the backyard of every fire station in Fairfax County. There just isn't, right? So where do you start? You have to start somewhere, right? And my recommendation is ask your people, H ask your stakeholders, you know, you go to any community. I, I don't care where you are in North America. Your community is going to tell you they want an educated workforce, right? So now you have to define as a fire chief, what does that mean? And how can I meet my people where they are, right? You don't want to make it so, so challenging and so restrictive that now you're preventing people from getting promoted because now you've placed a glass ceiling over them, right? Our professional development resource manual does not do that because it values time. It values experience and it also values education. But it's a balancing act between all of that, right? So where do you start? Start somewhere. But also look at your national models. The National Fire Academy has a model, right, for higher education. Yeah. The High Chiefs has a model for higher education. There are NFPA standards. Those are model agencies, right? Start somewhere. There's resources out there that we use every single day when we're evaluating our programs and how we can evolve, how we can get better. Like I said. We had a professional development resource guide. We drafted it again, made it into a manual, and now it's on the desk of our senior leaders because the fire service is evolving and we were not meeting our people where they were and we're not preparing our workforce for the known, the gray rhinos, and the black swans that we don't know. We, we just don't know, Aaron. Within a year, you're slated to have a flying vehicle. Somewhere in America, yes. there's going to be a yes. flying car, right? Are we prepared for that? I, I don't know. I don't what know. What is a crash? I, I didn't know, Aaron, 10 yeah. years ago, we were not prepared for the volume of fires that we've seen from lithium ion batteries. And FDNY is that prime example uh, of just the challenges and struggles they're facing day in and day out, and the other metropolitan areas as well. Yeah. And it's coming to every household. You can't listen to this and say, well, that's New York or that's Virginia, that's Fairfax County. Like, no. Look at your house. There's 35, you know, lithium ion batteries probably right within view of me right here. Um, 
But so that problem is coming. The health and wellness is another part of that. Is that also included in your personal development or your professional development program? I should say. Do we have programs that really focus on health and wellness? That is, that is, is taught in all of our, I would say officer certification courses because there are JPRs that are connected to health and wellness. Is it a formal class set aside by itself? No, it is not. Do we offer the NFA incident safety officer class, which kind of bridges that gap? Yes, we do. We do. That was an initiative from our ops chief that all company officers will be trained to the National Fire Academy incident safety officer level. And we're still meeting that objective today. So do we have bits and pieces of health and safety? Yeah. Do we have bits and pieces of data analytics? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can, you don't, like you said, you don't have to be in their face with an actual course, but if you mention how important decon is all the way along the boat, how mm -hmm. important annual medicals are, how important it is to, uh, you know, not only work on your professional side, but your personal development with health, wellness, fitness, right? right? Those are those little bits of, of information accumulate through time. And it sounds like that's the way you guys have, have addressed it, which I love to hear. And, and also we have to mention a national fallen firefighters foundation, yeah. FRC cancer, uh, firefighter cancer, um, uh, network, uh, support network. All those agencies actually do have a lot of free resources for, uh, education, you know, whether it's on health wellness, I know that NFFF has leadership. And so there are these resources out there. You do a Google search, you could probably come up with a nice start, I think. And that's kind of what you're saying there. Yeah, um, absolutely. What's, what's one thing that you would really hope that maybe you guys didn't get right the first time, but now you are like, Hey, I'm a hundred percent bought into this making sure you include this in your professional development. I think one thing that I think it goes back to the soft skills, right? It goes back to de-escalation strategies and conflict management. That's something we're continually working with and evolving. That's one thing that we're working hard to incorporate with our training programs. Uh, that's one thing that that is a work in progress, right? Because number one, it is evolving. But number two, Aaron, there are not that many individuals that are subject matter experts when it comes to teaching conflict resolution, conflict management skills, right? How to properly de-escalate. And I don't mean just, just, just patient and provider de-escalation strategies, right? What happens when you get back to the firehouse and there's a conflict and you have your shift members in conflict? What do you do as an officer? What do you do as a team member, as a teammate, when you see something that's not right? There's an individual that may be in crisis, right? And you don't understand or recognize the signs, right? It all goes back to those, those human skills, those soft skills that I think the fire service is still trying to get right. But I think one of the hurdles is, is finding the right people, those subject matter experts to come in and bridge that gap. And there's not a lot of people in the fire service that have that institutional knowledge. And for our industry, one of the things we've seen is that it's tough sometimes to have someone from the private sector come in, not understand our culture, not understand our traditions, not understand how we live every single day on shift work and what we're tasked with and what we're faced with and try to explain a, 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 a strategy or this circle of understanding or this circle of conflict management. They just need to learn us first. And that's the challenge. We have to be patient, but I think we also have to reach out to uh, outside of the fire service and say, look, we're going to meet you halfway and create this together. I, 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 and I think that's kind of what you're saying too. And, you know, we, we don't do a good job of reaching outside the fire service also, right. It, it, through the course of your career, has that changed? No, I mean, we still have, we still have our egos and we still have our silos, right? It's us versus them mentality. I think it's gotten better. That mentality across the industry has improved, um, but we still see it. But I, I tell you what, Aaron, if we don't bridge the gap um, from, from a, a, a technological perspective, from a human resource perspective, from a budget perspective, from a project management perspective, we're not the experts when it comes to that. And that's where the fire service is evolving, right? Um, one of the greatest mistakes you can make is promoting someone into, let's say, a higher executive rank. 
a deputy chief or maybe assistant chief that's never managed a project, that's never managed a budget. Well, now they're responsible for an entire bureau, an entire section or division that's responsible for maybe a million dollars and responsible for not only a uniform staff, but a civilian staff that has different needs and different wants. Yeah. That's where the fire service is evolving. The days of us strictly responding to calls, and that was our only charge, those days are slowly coming to an end. We have to evolve. I've heard someone say, how can that chief be ahead of budget? They can't even balance their own checkbook. You know, But that's a disservice to them, too, because we're, we're setting them up for failure and the organization up for failure, right? And that goes back to your whole plan. The plan just isn't for a firefighter to an AE or an AE to a, uh, to a lieutenant. You got to look at all the way up the board from, you know, your chief uh, to, you know, the recruit. And, and that's why it's, it's so great to have you on because I get fired up about this, too, because you, I, I see it. I'm, I'm 50 uh, next week and I'm a little bit older and come for, I came from outside the fire service and I understood the value of it there where I was working in business and, and, um, and health and wellness. But then when you come back into the fire service, you're like, well, what we, why are we not doing that same kind of thing here? Right. And building from within and training our, our own individuals to be successful. And so it's very refreshing to hear. Um, I do have uh, one question that is kind of eating away at me and I just got to do it and I'm gonna put you on the spot. So someone is, is listening to this. They're like, well, I can't do it prof a professionally. I like, I'm not in charge of that, but I, they're jotting notes. What would you recommend for the individual now? Whether they're, they wanted to stay where they're at, but they're just, I want to get a little better. I want to get more educated. What, what are three things that you think everybody needs to work on? That's a good question, Aaron. Um, and one of my biggest responses, you know, to those individuals that, that want to stay at the same rank, which is awesome, right? But also, too, you have to focus on it's just not about you. It's about your family. Where are you going to be in the long term? Like right now, you're at year five in the fire service or, or year seven or year 10, right? But where do you want to be at year 10, 15, year 20, year 25? And where is your family going to be? What are your, your, what are your family dynamics going to be like 10 years from now, 15 years from now? You, we, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't look that far in the future, right? So my biggest thing is give your agency, give your department members options. That's what it comes down to options, right? But if you're going to look at professionally developing yourself, number one, nowadays, too easy. I don't have to go to class. I can sign on on my computer. I can take everything online, right? Now, those, those, we do obviously have those promotional requirements within our agency where you will attend in person because we want that exchange. We want that dialogue, right? But nowadays, it's too easy, Aaron. Too easy. I got my bachelor's degree online. I didn't attend yeah. one class. I had a computer and I signed on and met all the requirements, which were painful, right? Painful because I still have a full-time job and I still had a family. And there are others out there that have other hurdles and challenges they have to face, which makes it even more difficult to get that degree, right? But it has got easier, right? What we want to be concerned about is, is I, I have to go back to the basics. It's math, reading, and writing. Those are the three foundational elements that are always going to make us better. I'm not asking you to be a scientist, right? I'm not asking you to be the author of books, right? Or write dissertations every time you write a narrative. But if you can't do math, how do you help as a medic when I need that med math, mm -hmm. right? If you can't read, how do you promote when you have an entire bibliography of books you have to absolutely read? And if you can't write, how do you stand up in court defending your actions that you took where maybe a citizen died? It's critically important. And it, to me, it's one of the foundational elements that a fire chief has to meet. Any chief, volunteer, career, it doesn't matter. You have to invest in your people. If you're not pouring into them, Aaron, you're going to be stuck with a workforce that's not developed. You have to make that conscious decision. You develop your people, you're making your agency, you're making your community better to meet the challenges of now 
and also the challenges of tomorrow. I preach this in a lot of our classes, right? There are three pillars, three pillars that support the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Patch. It's the community, it's the agency, and it's our great personnel. And if you're not investing in all those three pillars, you're failing as a fire chief. The personnel are so critical, so critical. The community is the mission. So we do it day in and day out. Yeah. It's no longer just about running calls, community risk reduction, collecting data. Where do we need to be as an agency? How do I get the right people with the right equipment at the right time, at the right place to do the right actions and save a life and save property? It and give them the support. Goes back to training, education, and development. Amen. Yeah. And giving them support, giving them a roadmap with, hey, here's how we can work as an agency. Here's how you can work as an individual. And I, I think you you really hit it on the head when when you said, just go back to the, sometimes the basics, the fundamentals, reading, writing, you know, uh, and, and arithmetic, mm -hmm. because we do use it as much as we like to say we don't, you know, there is more to the job, but you got to know how much hose line you got out. You got to know how, what, what to pump it. You got to know uh, how far away you are from places. So, you know, going back to fundamentals and, and educating on that. Rocco, how are you tracking success? Have you seen success um, with this professional development program at the department? We have. We have seen success. We've seen um, higher promotional exam scores, which I think goes back to some of our certification courses that we've seen. We've seen individuals that are that are now getting more involved in, in higher education. And we see those numbers through our tuition reimbursement program. Right. We're very fortunate. We have grant monies set aside. Again, we have a line item. Right. Whatever that line item comes from, wherever it comes from in your agency, whether it be internal, you know, as part of your budget whether it be grant money, whether it be a partnership with a business or the private sector, it doesn't matter. If you're creative and if you're a visionary, you will find money somewhere to help with tuition reimbursement, which is awesome. And again, that goes back to recruitment and retention, right? Um, so how are we seeing successes? I think we're seeing su successes. And at the end of the day, when it comes to human skills, right, those, those personality um, development programs, I think hopefully one of the successes, and we're still capturing the data is, hey, how are your grievances? How are your professional standards? How is your IA investigations? Are those numbers reduced? That's data that any agency can collect, right? So if, if you're developing conflict management or de-escalation or, 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 or other um, soft skills training, I think looking at that data should be key as far as what are the successes, right? Um, for us, and this just goes back to our last lieutenant's exam that we gave a year ago. Prior to that exam, we held a best practices and um, strategies class for those that are, were ready to take the lieutenant's exam. And that was just getting a, a folks who have always traditionally done well on promotional exams and they gave a class on how to study for the lieutenant's exam. Mm -hmm. Strategies, tips, and best practices on how to pass that exam. Because for us, that is a huge jump. Going from firefighter technician to lieutenant, huge jump in leadership responsibilities, right? And the promotional exam reflects that. Um, and speaking to the individuals that took our class, and again, this goes back to successes, and the individuals that um, that actually from that class and took the promotional exam, unbelievable responses. They, they, you guys nailed it. That was their response. Without your help, without the, the vision, without the class itself, I don't think I would have done as well. That's measuring success. We're getting ready to do the exact same thing with our apparatus technician exam, setting up a study session that involves what, Aaron? Math. Because we have, we have right. hydraulic questions on there, right? And traditionally, yep. our folks do not do well with hydraulic questions. Number one, you're already under stress from the exam, right? But we're going to show them strategies, tips, and best practices. So now this will be another round, another opportunity, Janelle, for us to collect data. Those individuals that sat in this study session, this class, this formal class that we're going to put on and host for our folks, what does that look like after the exam that's going to occur this fall? That's measuring success. And we're always collecting data. We're always giving out surveys from our classes and our programs. You know, the other thing I think we haven't mentioned yet, we've talked about recruitment, 
But what a great way to build better retention. Are you seeing that too in your data? Not yet, Aaron. We haven't, we haven't really dug deep into it yet. Uh, fortunately for us, we have an incredible data analytics section run by just an extreme wizard and, 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 and the staff up there, they're incredible, right? So it's really leveraging them to say, hey, how best can we collect this data and are we doing it the right way? So again, it's engaging those civilians within your workforce, within your department to help you kind of synthesize, hey, it's number one, synthesize the data, but also number two, are we doing this the right way? Is it the right approach? I think the transparency of it too keeps, you know, you get to that five, six, seven, eight year, and we saw in what Firefighters Want survey last year, it's kind of like where they're sometimes what we used to not see was now they're looking outside the fire service and contemplating going outside. Mm -hmm. But I think with what we've talked about today, you know, Hey, instead of looking at going outside the fire service, let me, let me look at growing within mm -hmm. the fire service. And how do I do that? There's a roadmap there. And I believe you are onto something very, very important. And I hope our listeners are taking some of that jotting notes, thinking about how they can set up, you know, or get something started within their department. And, and we can't thank you enough for your knowledge I know we'll have more conversations on this down the road, but before we let you go, let me put you in what's called the hot seat. We've got a couple of questions. You, you game for it? Um, I, I hope I don't let you down, Janelle. You are my new boss, so I don't want to let you down. <laughs> hardly, Good luck. Hardly. Good luck. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right, Chief. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing the fire service today? I hope this doesn't offend anyone. I really hope this doesn't. But you know what? I'm going to be truthful. I'm going to be honest. It is a lack of vision. It is a lack of vision. It is a lack of, of innovators and visionaries. That's what I see. That's what we need. Good answer. I think, I think you were in my station yesterday morning when the crews were talking. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Right. And that goes back to you. Then, then once you have that vision, it's easy to put together your development plan, right? Like it's start here, next step. We have Chief Fennessy on, and if if our listeners haven't listened to that one after you're finished with this great pod, this great episode, go listen to Chief Fennessy because he says the same thing, and and he actually laid out what he did from that that plan and how you know now you can add the per, the professional development side to it. So um, we're gonna have to get these two guys together, I think, Janelle. By the way, those two guys. <laughs> um, yeah. You got to be a dreamer, Janelle. Look, at the end of the day, you got to be a dreamer. Read right and dream you know there's nothing wrong with it you know sometimes those dreams may never never come to fruition those visions may never come to fruition but at least you're trying you're trying to move that that peg one step forward and that's critically important for us there are so many leaders out there janelle that started off and i've shared this before that have started off walking on glass and coals right but what they left for aaron and me they left brick pavers right? Well, now Aaron and I will at some point walk on glass and coals and it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility as leaders, as officers, as those in the fire service to lay down a brick path. So those that come after us can walk on that smooth road. They're going to face challenges and hurdles too, right? But that's where professional development helps them overcome those challenges, I believe. Well, speaking on that, you know, let's look at our, at you, what's your biggest challenge um, for you personally? You know, my biggest challenge is, my biggest problem is not being able to say no, number one, <laughs> like adding to my workload, you know, that's my biggest problem. My biggest challenge is, you know, it, like everyone else, it, it's, it's being uncomfortable. It's taking that first step from the comfort zone going into the uncomfortable zone. And I think that's what makes us better firefighters, better leaders, better servants, better trans transformational leaders. Let's be very specific. It's stepping out of your comfort zone. That's my biggest challenge. We get so comfortable sometimes as an individual, as a section, bureau, division, agency, that we're not, we, we just become risk averse and we have to stop, take a risk. It doesn't work, Janelle. So what? Pivot. Look at the data. Look at what we could have done better and then redirect. That's that's the biggest challenge, Aaron, to sum it up, risk averse. Take a risk. 
All right, next on the list, who has been the biggest influence in your life to get you where you are today? Biggest influence? There are so many. There really are. Faith, family, and friends. That's been my biggest influence. I would not be where I am without God, number one, and without my family support, you know, just like everyone else out there. You know, there are struggles. It's not easy working in this fire service. It's just not. Shift work sucks because it takes a toll on your family. Aaron, you know, Janelle, you know from your experiences, being away from your family for a full day, that sucks. Missing holidays, missing those ball games, it takes a toll on your family. And we wonder why we have mental health issues in the fire service or public safety in general. Faith, family, friends, without them, I'd be nothing. And within that mix, and those friends include obviously coworkers, all ranks, um, the mentors, the mentors, incredible mentors there that have helped me along the way and sometimes punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to ask, you know, you know, is that, that's obviously one of your big mentors. And, and, and with that, you know, that punch in the face made you much better, right? It helped you improve professionally, personally. How are you continuing that today? How are you getting better? Journey, journey. I'm not, I'm not going to stop. Um, and, and I will say this, right, Aaron, like those sands in the hourglass, like they're dropping. Like I've got some significant time in the fire service. Um, 38 years. I started this, 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 this journey. Um, I'm not done yet. Right. I'm still working on my dash. I've got my beginning date. I don't know when my end date for my career is. I was only God knows when my end date for my, my, my life is right. Which is, mm -hmm. which is fine, but I'm still working on my dash. I, I, I still want to get better there, but I, I want to make sure that while I'm getting better, that I'm bringing people with me. The worst thing you can do is not inspire others. The worst thing you can do is not create a pathway for others success. Once you stop developing others, it's time for you to leave. It really is. You need to find another profession, another job, because the fire service is all about developing others. There is one thing in the fire service that has never changed, training. You can be guaranteed when you show up to work on day one as a recruit to the day you leave, when you retire, you are going to train. You are going to train. And that, train, that training has to be significant. It has to be intentional. It has to be effective. And it has to be efficient. And it has to meet our needs as an agency. That's one thing that will never change, Aaron. Never. And I am so grateful that I've been fortunate enough and I got my training or I got my start in training working at Mifri back in the day when I came down here to Maryland. Um, I, I wouldn't I would never change my road that I'm on. Training is awesome. I love it. Well, we uh, we appreciate your passion for it uh, and which is why you're such a great fit for uh, you know, being on the show. We also appreciate those that have mentored you because they've fired you up and you've transferred that onto inspiring us and inspiring our listeners. Uh, and with that, we can't thank you enough. Uh, if you want to hear uh, more, actually see chief actually, and he, there is a passion behind what he says. There's a passion behind every sentence be and there's a lot of feeling, but uh, if you're listening to this podcast, why don't you come over to the YouTube channel on firerescue1.com and watch it because uh, you could see firsthand how inspiring he is. Uh, we also want you when you're there to rate and review the show. And, and uh, if you could send us a message, you think we're onto something here or on something, you can send us a message at better every shift at firerescue1.com. But to reiterate what, what Chief Alvaro was talking about and emphasizing through the course of this, this episode, get uncomfortable, challenge yourself. Most importantly, plan and then train, develop those around you, inspire those around you. And that goes back to what we're all about on this show. It's learning something, doing something and sharing something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody.